Good morning. Uh, thanks you. Thank you very much. I hope I'm, you can hear me. Uh, I'm Ala Kudbani, uh, Syrian journalist, Syrian origin journalist. I'm, I live in France. I'm an expatriate for a very long time. And now working for the French Daily Liberation. I've been working with the news, newspaper uh, exactly since 2011 when the Syrian protests started. And this was the main reason why I got into this newspaper. And I've been working since then. Uh, what I would like to say about uh, my experience with the media scene in, in, in Syria, I, maybe I would tell my own uh, experience on the ground, which started in 2011 when uh, the regime would not give any visa to any foreign journalist to go and, uh, and cover the, the protests, which were denied anyway. Uh, so since I still had a Syrian passport, I could get in and go to Damascus as in a family visit. And the, well, we can't talk about media in Syria at that time when I w was there. There was silence all over the place. It was denial all over the place. Nobody could really cover, or no, the, the public would not know what was happening in the country. Uh, rumors only uh, in few circles. Uh, social media started to bring about the news. But talking about the media landscape in Syria before 2011 is almost a desert. I mean, it's, it, is, it was like in any uh, dictatorship or totalitarian country in the way that there was this official media, official TV, official uh, government uh, newspapers or uh, groups close to the government. So there was nothing as uh, independent media or objective or uh, not uh, controlled, uncontrolled media by the government. Uh, so that's why, and there was also not no real professional journalist in that way, because most of them, some had, there was a course, I think, in university for journalism, but uh, they couldn't read it. You had a very little uh, independent journalist, but they would write on culture, on business maybe, and in very special, uh, with, with a lot of uh, self-censorship anyway. Uh, so the landscape was no media. And as I said, when I got in Damascus, it was April 2011. Uh, the protest had started almost a month before. And uh, everything was underground, really. Uh, I, it took me a few days to discover there was nothing really on, in the open. The protest would be organized very secretly. And uh, the information would go uh, through very special uh, networks, uh, closed networks. So, no, I wouldn't speak neither of journalism nor of media at that time. But of course, the repression against all the activists, any kind of activism, uh, including those young who started uh, trying to get out the information out of Syria, and especially uh, in getting in contact with the Arab uh, TV networks, such as Al Jazeera and so on. And I think this was the very first attempt by the young activists on to work as as not as journalists, I would say, but as news uh, outlets. I mean, just to make uh, the world know what was really happening inside Syria. And this, this is really how it all started, uh, with those activists starting to take videos 
of demonstrations of uh, or repression of uh, what was happening on the ground and, and was completely denied by the by the government and the regime and they would find ways to uh, export to uh, send those videos and show that well, what was happening while the world was completely uh, un, uh, unaware of what what was happening on the ground and the fir those first networks in France for example there were some Syrians who started helping uh, the young by uh, giving them uh, internet connections, uh, helping them reach the international media. Uh, some uh, TV networks here started uh, getting all those videos uh, and make, uh, making building stories out of them. So those young were were even more motivated to produce and to give. Of course, they were taking great risks. And most of the time, as all activists, but especially those who were trying to get out the pictures and the videos and the realities on the ground, there would be many, many, uh, dozens of them were arrested, imprisoned, uh, and of course, tortured most of the time. I have personally uh, had a very sad experience, very traumatic experience with a young man. I was always in contact with. He came from Daraa, but then he would live in the suburbs of Damascus, and he would go out, and he would be always. I, I had him online all the time by Skype. We used to talk. He would give me all the information, and he would get, uh, send videos. And, and then one day, all of a sudden, it was the beginning of 2020, we were in contact for the whole, almost a year, and he would give me almost daily information. Uh, I didn't hear from him at all. Uh, he disappeared. He disappeared, and of course, I was very uh, concerned. I asked about him, nobody knew. And uh, of course, I thought he was arrested. Uh, one or two years later, one of his brothers contacted me and said, yes, he confirmed that he was arrested, and he, but he was in prison, and he was okay. That was in 2013. Uh, and then uh, a few years, many years later, just after the season, the season pay, uh, pictures and all, I, it was confirmed that he was, he was dead under torture in, in prison. But this is one person I knew. Uh, I heard, of course, about many, many others. And But I just wanted to recall this uh, personal uh, relationship with a young on the ground who, who, as I wouldn't say journalist, but as, yes, uh, giving information uh, outside the country that was says he was an activist and journalists as all activists were of course uh, repressed and arrested and tortured and uh, and targeted because because there was a war in of information from the beginning to the end of the Syrian crisis there there was been there has been a war of information a war of narratives uh, the regime and uh, its allies kept saying that they were facing from the first day uh, Islamic terror, which was not the case uh, to be the first years of the protest. And uh, while uh, the, the opposition and the activists and the protesters, of course, were trying to tell the world that uh, they had a legitimate uh, uh, cause in asking for democracy, for freedom, for stopping of oppression, and being able to to live as uh, decent citizens. So, uh, 
Hi, if you me find Ms. Carmen, this is Almudena Bernabios speaking. May I just stop you there for a minute? I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions before this. Oh, yes. Yeah. But all right. Uh, just so that we can have this on the record. When, when you tried to enter, and you did it for personal reasons in 2011 in Syria, um, where you, who you were, um, what outlet you were working for? You mean when I went yes. to report in Syria? Yes. In 2011, I was I went really not as a journalist. For me. I went uh, as a as a Syrian who used to go expatriate to see her family. So I was alone. Uh, I, I was with my family. I led the first days the normal life I would do if I was on holiday in Syria. But, but then, of course, everybody was talking about all that, and. Connection by connection through my cousins and all, I got in contact with some protesters uh, in Damascus, around Damascus. Uh, but I wasn't accompanied. Uh, I, I would go on the, or I wouldn't put them in danger. But I, nobody was uh, identifying me, especially the government forces, as a journalist. I was there as a visiting. Syrian. And why would what, what was the situation of journalism, whether international uh, or national, prior to the, to 2011? You were talking about the secrecy in this uh, underground uh, uh, approach. What was happening with journalism prior to that moment? Well, before 2011, I would say the Syrian uh, uh, media scene was just it was like in any. Uh, dictatorship or when censorship was complete, foreign journalists uh, would be accepted when they have a visa from the government, of course, and they would be accompanied all the time by a interpreter or translator who, of course, would be uh, would, would be surveying and uh, making surveillance on on whatever movement. Uh, no journalist, no foreign journalist could go alone, independently, go around in the, the Damascus or in any other place in Syria without being under strict control and having this accompanying, uh, which was paid for by the, by the uh, outlet, by the media outlet anyway, the journalist. But uh, that, and of course, to get a visa was a first step, complicated because they would refuse visas for journalists known not to be favorable or to be uh, to have written uh, things that the government doesn't like. So the first uh, way of selecting uh, was to give or not give a visa. Uh, for Western journalists or whatever, whoever journalists uh, would go to Syria. And that's what I used, in fact, through my Syrian citizenship. I was able to get in because I didn't need a visa. And at that time, I was a freelance in France, and some newspapers said, no, no, we, we're not interested in your reports because our journalists have asked for visas. They're waiting for them. Uh, of course, they never got them. Right. And uh, that's so the first step was the visa question. The second step was once you get into Damascus, it was the control. You were permanently under the control with accompanied by this interpreter who was part of the Ministry of the Information. So, the, the, of course, the, they would uh, uh, make a program often to, you have to meet this minister and this responsible, and you can go and visit uh, Palmyra and uh, the Souks, and that, but you couldn't go to this or that place. The program of the visits was completely controlled, all movements. Uh, journalists could, of course, ask uh, to go to this place or that, but they wouldn't. Be, and how about, they wouldn't have the agreement. And how about to your, if you know, uh, Syrian-based, Syrian journalist. There was an exchange with internationals. Were you aware of the situation of the Syrian colleagues in those days? 
the Syrian colleague before in before 2011 you mean yes prior to the, mm. to the not really not really I not really I I only knew that there was no independent media uh, I didn't know how, how I didn't have many contacts in the uh, Syrian media and well, I wasn't interested to tell you the truth at that time because it all seemed so frozen and so uh, repression was total. Uh, you couldn't hear really dissident voices anywhere except in the among the expatriates. But uh, I didn't really. I I don't think there was a media scene in Syria uh, before 2011, or media activists or or people trying really to work on information. And then one cha what changed in 2011 that created this, this media, this group of, of uh, outlets, new outlets? It was at the, at the beginning, as I said, it was really not as a professional media workers. I mean, it was really activists wanting to get the information out, wanting the world to know what was happening. Uh, that was the first uh, aim. And then one, of course, one of the means of letting people know and, and mobilizing uh, people around them, activists started uh, publishing small leaflets in, in little towns. Uh, of course, the most uh, famous uh, example is Aina Baladi, which was in Daraya in the uh, suburbs of Damascus. And it was really, I, I, it was two leaflets, you know, just, uh, uh, and it was distributed in, uh, in little uh, shops, in grocery shops, uh, and was to let people know what was happening and to give examples and to make contacts and, uh, and, I don't know, the three pages, four pages, grew and grew up and uh, went, then went outside Syria and became today one of the main uh, independent uh, media outlets, uh, Syrian independent, of course, published from Turkey for the past uh, seven or eight years. But at, and at that time, uh, the journalists started being interested in, I mean, really discovering how important it is to gather news, to work on them, to give the news, to spread the information. And I think that was critical because, and I was very touched after that when I talked to those young activists who started writing the pieces or taking videos and uh, giving them out. Uh, the how passionate all of a sudden they were for this job and for this mission in a way. It wasn't only a job. What were the contents of those pamphlets, of those um, small initial initiatives? What were, the, what were the news that they were reporting? What was in it? What was the content? I'm sorry, I the, the sound is very... Is it bad? Sorry, uh, I can speak. Can you repeat your questions? What was, what was in those pamphlets? I mean, what were the news that this younger or kind of uh, experimental... Uh, yeah, was there was, to? yes. Uh, you could have uh, news. I mean, they would, they would give news. Of course, sometimes practical news uh, saying, don't take this uh, road because uh, there are snipers. This can be dangerous. How to protect yourself? But they would also uh, try to give mobilize, mobilize, say, yes, and we are determined, and uh, the protests about the protests, and writings about the protests, uh, bringing even information from outside, seeing that the, the, they are supported by this Arab country or this uh, Western country. They would start with the local information, which relevant for the people, uh, saying where to go, where not to go, how to protect yourself, uh, how to be safe. 
and and then and then there was this aspect of trying to mobilize around the, the protest to gain the the interest and the support of the population uh, you had always also uh, social uh, work in the, in those uh, publications because some some announcements that uh, somebody needs this and that there's a family in need or the doctor uh, available for uh, some people if they didn't want to go for example to government hospitals because for this is an example when there were the demonstrations and protesters were uh, were being fired at and uh, were hurt and uh, they, they wouldn't go to the hospitals because they could be arrested and, uh, and not treated. So this kind of information would come out. They, of course, all the, the repression that the, the, the protesters were facing was also one of the main topics inside the, the newspapers, those, those little uh, pamphlets. And what was the, the state response or the different agencies of the state? Of course, repression all the time. Uh, I mean, at, at that time they would, they would arrest, of course, whoever was identified or whoever would, would come. I think, I, and I, I, I remember that at that time, every, everything was underground. Uh, those young uh, protesters who were writing or uh, publishing or distributing uh, those little papers would hide. Uh, they were all in, uh, they, they couldn't be uh, seen anywhere. And they would move among themselves, among really close, close circles and confidence. But, and, and there were, they, there were some uh, betrayals, unfortunately, at that time. But uh, the there was also, I must say, probably, but I'm not very an expert in that. Uh, th there was also the cyber uh, control. Uh, the government would very much be uh, trying to control as Facebook to spy on the Facebook to get into accounts uh, to, and that was one of the major ways of. Uh, arresting and going after protesters. Uh, face, Facebook posts were an, an accusation as such. If anybody would write a post criticizing what was happening or the, the repression or the, the government and so on, it was enough to arrest him and, uh, and put him uh, under torture or whatever. So uh, the there was this cyber war, which was essential because uh, a lot of the activity, but, and it was a, a real war because at the same time, the protesters, the activists would find also ways to protect their own writings, their own uh, publications, or they would take, of course, uh, uh, not use their, their, their names uh, and, uh, and they were often helped by groups outside. I know in France, for example, that some groups were giving advice to uh, Syrian groups in order not to be detected by the services, by the police services of, uh, of, the, of the government. They would give him some tips uh, on how to use the social media, communicate among them without being discovered. To, the, to your knowledge, um, at the time the, the crisis of the revolution began, Syria, uh, in whatever regiment it was, it was kind of a functioning country. You mentioned that in 2012, a colleague of yours who had been helping you, or a young man who was helping you, was arrested and later mm. disappeared. To your knowledge, was it any agency of the state um, responding to demands of where are these people or family requests as they began arresting. I mean, was at any time any uh, state response or any effort, any agency doing this, or it was 
um, or even you, for instance, as a colleague, tried to get information officially about this disappeared person? Mm. Uh, that was very difficult because, of course, there was a total break between the government institutions, the services, uh, agencies, uh, repression uh, thing, and and the the, the means that uh, so those supporting activists or journalists could use. Uh, our only way was to uh, tell about what was happening to international bodies, international media, international NGOs, uh, of course, those supporting uh, the Syrian uh, protest for and, uh, uh, and democratic forces. So we didn't, there was no way of getting in touch and, it, it was a wall between all the government bodies and the rest of the population and the rest of the world and the rest of the, those who were opposed. Thank you very much. I, I don't know if I answered. I'm sorry, what? Sorry, the, the, the no, I, I don't know if I answered your question. That's yes, yes, you did. Thank you. I don't think I have any more okay, questions. Thank you. Uh, maybe the, the panel of judges may, may ask some questions now. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have uh, one, uh, one of the judges uh, online uh, from Australia. Uh, Gil Beringer, would you like to say something? I'm sorry, we can't see you on the screen. Yes, now, now you can. <laughs> yes, thank you very much for your most informative testimony. Um, one, one thing that uh, I don't understand, uh, and of course we're talking uh, about the period from 2011 to the present uh, and the murder of journalists. Where did the journalists come from? You, you've spoken about young activists and social media and this, that, and so forth, and that was really interesting. But I'm wondering um, whether those people grew up and, and, and learned from their own experience. Did they go abroad and get training? Were these really professional journalists yeah. or what? Can you elaborate for us? Thank you. I can, I can, of course, yes, it, it is very important because I only spoke about the beginnings of what was happening. And uh, then it was, yeah, it was a very big development in the years following. Because uh, when those young uh, activists who were giving information uh, wanted to, they wanted to professionalize and Many uh, media organization, media development organization, European or American, uh, were able to get in contact with them and started organizing training sessions for those to professionalize them. The first aim was to help them uh, be more professional in giving out the information, in writing better, in uh, 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 shooting the videos, uh, wh how to show things, to give, for example, tell them to put the dates, uh, the places, they, because they were really completely uh, un unaware of uh, journalistic work. <laughs> and, and then it was a huge effort by all sorts of NGOs, especially when uh, the Syrians could get out of Syria uh, and were, and when uh, many areas of Syria were going out of control from the government and being controlled by opposition forces. So uh, the young Syrians were free to travel, especially to Turkey, to go, go in and out. And I worked also with uh, several media or development organizations, French, uh, Danish, uh, and to for organize really uh, training sessions for those young uh, journalists who would start, you know, outlets, they were radio, uh, 
little radios started being created, uh, newspapers, uh, TVs, and of course, online uh, outlets, information outlets. So they would pick up, they would pick up a group of uh, Syrian journalists from various regions, for example, one from Damascus, one from Aleppo, one from uh, Idlib, and so on, and gather in Turkey and organize really uh, sessions on the basics of journalistic work, on the ethics, on the uh, you know, verifying information to have uh, accurate uh, dates and figures and, and, of course, after that to be able to write a good story or to tell a good story by radio. Uh, little by little, also those uh, organizations helped create or uh, professionalize some newspapers or radios, uh, little radios inside Syria or outside. Uh, so uh, there were really, at, at some time, there were dozens of little pamphlets being published in almost each village, Syrian village, especially that they were not under control any longer. I mean, the, the, all the areas where the government forces were evicted were, were out. So they were free and in any paper. That, so there were dozens of, uh, little, but of course, not many survived long, some only uh, were made for a, a few weeks and then it was a small group. But uh, this organization, the, the media developer organizations who really were interested in uh, having, creating a new, uh, new media, Syrian media, democratic, I mean, it was of course in the perspective of having a democratic Syria and having professional journalists able to work freely in a democratic free Syria, which as you know, unfortunately was not uh, it. But at that time anyway, I would say even there was uh, in the years from 2013 to 2016, uh, in, at any time in Istanbul or Gaziantep or other Syrian towns close to the Syrian borders, there were training sessions organized. And <clears throat> even there was at some time at Gaziantep for a whole year, a European center for uh, the Syrian media, uh, which was uh, yeah, run by the uh, and government a French government uh, organization, but with European funds. Uh, it was a very nice place where there would be, of course, training sessions, and they had a TV studio, radio studio, where all the young Syrians could come and uh, do their work, uh, edit their, uh, their shootings and uh, uh, and also we had also many uh, symposiums and uh, exchange. So there was a really a, a lot of work done to professionalize those first who were activists and they, be, be, they really became very good professional journalists. Thank you. Thank you. I think Kalpana. Yeah, hello. Thank you for um, presenting the issue to us so clearly. But there are a couple of things about which I'm confused and I'd like uh, clarification. Uh, first, sure. um, as far as I can understand, mainstream media in Syria still remains completely government controlled, right? So the alternatives right. that you've talked about, my question is, if the mainstream media is putting out the narrative that the government wants, in what way is the reach of the independent media able to counter that narrative? And the second part of that is, with hindsight, do you feel that we as professional journalists have to rethink uh, the status of what are called stringers, fixers, etc., but without whom actually many of us would never be able to report? And it is not just in places with conflict, but also in countries with huge inequalities, where you know big media cannot reach areas 
where many of the atrocities um, and violations of human rights are taking place and they are entirely dependent on these un not professionally trained journalists, but they are still the people who collect the information and give it to us. So do we need to reevaluate? And I say this because the excuse that they're not journalists is used by all governments, uh, irrespective of whether freedom of the press is guaranteed in the constitution or not, to say that uh, they were this, they were that, they were anti-national, they were troublemakers, and they're not therefore entitled to the protection that journalists are supposed to get. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think this is a very important point you are raising. Uh, I'd answer first the first question uh, about the, the narrative of the mainstream media inside Syria. Uh, the thing is, what is interesting is that most of the Syrians do not believe their mainstream uh, media. It, they, not only they don't believe them, <laughs> they, they, they are convinced that they are lying all the time. So that, that's very interesting. And that helps, of course, the, the counter narrative because the people are already convinced that what they are getting from the mainstream media is propaganda and not information. And this has been the case for years, uh, even long before the protest. And that's why uh, the, in Syria, like in and many other Arab countries, when uh, Arab uh, news uh, channels such as Al Jazeera or others started uh, broadcasting, everybody would go and listen to their information because they, the mainstream media narrative was not accepted, was not believed anyway. Uh, now, the, and I would say that that helped the mission of the opposition uh, media. But what I would uh, maybe mention here is the interesting development of free media was the, its diversity. And you had several narratives or several uh, comments or analysis of the situation, whether it was uh, secular groups or Islamic uh, groups or conservative or progressive. So this was the very interesting developments that started in the uh, new media, uh, new Syrian media, uh, whether in, inside the, the country or from Turkey being published. And so is the diversity, which did, does not exist uh, now anywhere in uh, most of the Arab world. Now about this, a very important questions about uh, the, the fixes on the ground. And uh, I was, uh, I, I, I was in a very special situation because when I went to report in Syria after, after 2012, I went several times in crossing the Syrian, the Turkish border as did all my colleagues, European or American, and that because we, we could easily go in and out. My advantage, of course, was being Syrian and speaking the language and having contacts on the ground. I didn't always need fixers, but I also worked with uh, young photographers, for example, who in a way, young Syrian photographers, who in a way were my fixers. And, uh, and we worked together and published papers and paper and pictures and photos together as a team one to in uh, in the French newspapers I was working with. Uh, now, of course, my my colleagues from France or, or other uh, countries needed and uh, really uh, relied on Syrian fixes and often asked me if I could advise them or introduce them, uh, help them find the Syrian fixers on the ground. Uh, here I would just mention the detail, which was uh, uh, problematic, is not many Syrians uh, could speak uh, other languages than, than Arabic. So uh, those who could, who could speak English or even French, French was uh, unbelievable, but 
those who really uh, could speak French, English, uh, they had very good work. They were very, uh, they were very, very much asked for, and uh, of course they would be really de uh, devoted to the journalists they were uh, they were helping and they were working with. They would drive them. They would often be their drivers. They would often protect them, get them the protection of, for uh, example, some uh, armed groups in the area where they would go. Uh, they would translate, of course. Uh, it, and often the, those so-called fixers were basically journalists. I mean, either they would work for a local media, radio uh, outlet, newspaper. They could be so, and and they got a lot of experience by the years, so they knew what interested. Uh, usually, the Western journalists, foreign journalists from this country or that. So they would even propose the stories, say, well, there could be an interesting story here about women, about children, about, you know, the diversity. And of course, <coughs> those fixers were on the first row when, when there was a threat against uh, journalists, they would uh, at the same time be try to protect as much as they can the journalists they were working with, uh, but they were all, always also uh, facing the, the threats and uh, in case uh, that there was, there was an attack or in case some, some or there was uh, some taken hostages. So it was a, also a responsibility for them uh, and an exposure. Yes, I think Eduardo. Oh, sorry. Yes. Thank you very much for your testimony, Madame Kodmani. Uh, I would not say uh, seen as naive with my with my questions, but for our work, it's very important to have very concrete answers coming from you. I understand that you're living in France, right? Right. Okay. Uh, is it any possibility that you return to Syria? I could return to Syria. I mean, I have returned until 2015, last time I was in Syria, in Aleppo. But of course, I can't go to uh, regime-controlled areas. And now that regime-controlled areas are the most areas, it was becoming difficult. That I could go into the northeast or northwest uh, by dealing with either the Kurdish authorities or the or with an authorization from Turkey. But uh, yeah, I'm not very encouraged to do that. I've been so many times independently that I don't like very much the idea of being controlled by one or other of the parties on the ground. So do you think that you cannot work as an independent journalist if you return to Syria? Uh, now, yes, I don't, I'm not sure I can work or move like I want, uh, wherever I want, uh, because uh, yes, there is a control. I know from a few, very few journalists who go in uh, that they are embedded in a way uh, either with military or civilian forces and asked to do things and not to do things especially. So I I wouldn't say maybe I will I will go because I miss going on the ground and I miss the Syrians uh, living inside Syria and to see the situation and it's never the same to be in contact and and being on the ground. So I I would probably uh, go soon, but so far I resisted going because I felt I could I was. Uh, having to be under control. And my my last question, saying that we always we are always proud for brave journalists, but 
we don't want martyrs, okay? So uh, uh, you say that you can return, um, but you cannot do your work independently because of the reasons that you just mentioned. Uh, let's say that you decided the contrary, to go back and to work as an independent journalist, in your opinion and according to your experience, what do you think that will happen to you? Uh, it depends where. Uh, it depends where. What well, again in regime control areas? It's out of question. I mean, they were. I would be arrested uh, on the border. I was crossing, whether coming from Lebanon or to the Damascus airport. I think at least I would be arrested uh, upon arrival. So this is out. Uh, there's the north. Uh, eastern region, uh, uh, the, mainly controlled by the Kurdish authorities. Uh, here, they have a very good and well organized uh, way of dealing with journalists, and they have got dozens and maybe, maybe hundreds of journalists going in in the past few years from all Western countries, especially when there was the uh, uh, war against the Islamic State because everybody would cross uh, this region. Uh, and they are very proud to show their autonomy. They have a politically motivated uh, welcome to journalists, but of course uh, they wouldn't let all journalists go on some grounds. They are very happy to show the women uh, fighters, Kurdish women fighting, and uh, but in case you ask too much, many questions, uh, they wouldn't uh, answer. That's what I know from many colleagues, uh, French or other, who went to the, what is called the Rojava region. Uh, so here, I wouldn't say there would be a threat, but you can't be fully independent, depending on what. Yeah. And uh, so this is for the northeast, the situation in the northeast, where why would I not feel independent to work as I want? Uh, the northwest is a, is a even more complicated situation because uh, to get in, you have to have a Turkish authorization, Turkish army authorization, and the Turkish army would first of all select what the journalist they would accept in or not and then uh, those who are in control of this uh, region uh, there are all sorts of opposition groups but dominated by uh, Islamic uh, jihadis uh, who are very conservative who would not let you uh, a journalist go around on his own anyway, nor meet the people we would like to meet, nor stay where we want. Now I have an, an alternative personally, but this is because it's me and I, I could use it, is what I did at the first time in Damascus is not to go in as a journalist, to go as a Syrian expatriate uh, coming to work with an NGO when women uh, uh, training or whatever. I could do that. And then, as I did the first time, write stories about what I saw. A, but as a journalist, as a professional journalist, it is not possible for the moment, in my opinion, to work independently in any part of Syria. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, thank you for your exposition. I want to know what is the current situation of the Syrian local Syrian press now. You talk about this blooming of journalists and media, and what happened with these local journalists mm. and media. Uh, yeah, it, it is an interesting question. Uh, I would say most of them, most of them, ninety-nine percent uh, are out of Syria. Uh, anyway. The older activists, as um, many other 
activists or uh, protesters in Syria, they are out. They are out either in Turkey or in Europe or whatever. Now, uh, many, of course, stopped uh, working as journalists. Others uh, followed up. And some of the media outlets created since 2011 or after uh, are still now published from Turkey, essentially. And they have quite a lot of circulation among Syrians. As you know, there are uh, about uh, six to seven million Syrians now out of Syria since the beginning of the war. So you have a whole audience very interested uh, in what's happening. So those journalists, some of them uh, mainly in Turkey, uh, there are several outlets who have their websites, even if they don't publish any longer papers, but they have their website, they give information. They have correspondence on the ground. Uh, I mean, they ask people on the ground to give their, uh, to tell what is happening. So you can consider you have some uh, new reporters still inside the country working for those Syrian uh, media outlets that are based either in Turkey, mainly, and in some uh, European countries. Uh, yeah, we have a radio, for example, here in around Paris, working in Rosanna, uh, still working well, and I think they have their audience, they have their website, uh, and because now the Syrian issue is very wide. Now they can. Some of them have in media out Syrian outlets in, in Germany among the Syrian community, which is a huge. Uh, and some of those journalists who started as activists in 2011, 2012, are now in Turkey and publishing uh, newspaper. I don't know the, the names, so, but I know that there was more than one a newspaper or a website uh, even Syrian uh, made in in Germany, for example. And, uh, and as I said, many, many Syrians who started as activists in media working or in information really got this passion for this job, for this mission, and, 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 and often made uh, more trainings and some of them went back to university when they went to Europe, followed real uh, studies uh, formerly of journalism and media work uh, in many places. Where I know some in France, but in other countries, uh, European countries also. Yes. Um, thank you, thank you for uh, your testimony. First of all, just to be uh, um, to check if I understood correctly, uh, you said that now in the present, uh, I mean in these last few years, um, you spoke of a, a diversity of uh, narrative, uh, uh, secular, Islamic, conservative, or progressive, etc., in the media now. And then you say that uh, most of the um, independent media, I mean the non-regime uh, media, are published or are run uh, from Turkey or from some European country. Um, so uh, in the regime control territory, in the Syrian government official uh, control territory, there are no opposition media, or are they? And these media that are published in Turkey or elsewhere, how do they reach the ground? They are online media, I imagine, or are they printed? But that would be very difficult to circulate in Syria, I suppose. So how do they reach? What is their audience? How do they reach the Syrian citizens, for instance, in the government-held uh, areas? Thank you. Yes, of course. Uh, about the first question, opposition media in regime controlled areas do not exist. This is out. 
it's impossible, it has never been possible, it's still not possible, as legal. Uh, work. Uh, of course, many people in the regime control area can follow. Now, everything is online. And even if uh, the regime has their own censorship or can block uh, some uh, websites, information websites, uh, there are, of course, ways of getting through. And many, many uh, Syrians inside the, the regime control areas would read and follow all the, uh, the, the websites, the outlets through the internet. So they do get the information, uh, but I wouldn't say there is no production of information inside the con regime controlled area, but uh, the information does reach the people in, in those areas, the information coming from outside. Now, as you say, uh, coming from those, so those media outside, whether in Turkey or Europe, all are uh, mainly address the Syrian population inside, inside Syria and inside the regime controlled area. And uh, I think they all know because, you know, website now, they, they, they can know where uh, their audience is. And I know that some uh, newspapers and radios from Syria, the Syrian here in Europe, uh, told me that they can, they know because, for example, when the connection is, when they have a lot of connections from the U.S., this means it's inside Syria. Because uh, the, the software used to divert the government control of web, the website, the government blocking, it's a very technical matter. I don't fully understand. But I understand that it seems like you are, even if you are connecting from Damascus, it looks like it was, you are in Los Angeles. So, but the experts know how to evaluate this. Is the well, VPN... all this is to say that... I had one uh, uh, question and clarification, but uh, I think I know the answer, but just to hear you, you say, you spoke of uh, continuing, you used the term correspondents or reporters inside the country who are mm -hmm. providing the information. Uh, and I'd like to know, uh, I assume these are not identified by by name. It's an anonymous question, but uh, that is, you know, I'd like to hear you say yeah. about that. And how does the course, information yeah, get out said. in the first place? Mm. Yes, of course, they would be uh, anonymous. I mean, they they couldn't sign their papers, those correspondents who have stayed. Uh, some are not professional, but they just send the information and a professional journalist would edit it and write it in, uh, in a constructive way. But there are still a few, not many, uh, inside, especially inside the non-government controlled areas, that can send information, uh, be report to uh, some Syrian outlet. They will be anonymous. Uh, they have many uh, yes, technical devices to protect the fact that they are sending whether a video or a uh, or, or what, whatever they are sending. Uh, it's very protected. Uh, again, I'm not very good at uh, technical matters, but uh, there are still inside Syria, uh, very difficult to identify by uh, other than the outlet or the people they are directly working with. Which will be your definition or how you, do you make the difference among reporters, journalists from activistic, activists using social media? Yes, how do you say uh, the definitions? I, in fact, I, I think it's a question of uh, time because those that started as activists became uh, reporters and then grew up to be more professional journalists. 
grew up and were trained. And so it, it was a progression. Uh, of course, they kept as professional journalists after that, their activist uh, inspiration and the, the, what they start, they started doing journalism and media work for their cause. So the cause remains, but they become professional journalists. And it's just a question of time. Now, new uh, young journalists on the ground st also started activists. We have a new generation uh, now growing and following the, the path of the former ones, the generation of 2011 and 2012. Thank you. I think uh, that's en enough of the judges for the moment. Thank you so much for this very detailed uh, account.